we won't see the chat box and we won't be able to, to ask us any questions. Yeah. Okay, so um, that being said, we would like to recognize that although we are an online event, we are collectively surrounding the unceded uh, Coast Salish territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Squamish and tsleil uh, my name is Priscilla Amulo. I am a Sartlip First Nation. I'm currently um, a resident of the uh, Coquitlam First Nation, and I am the new program coordinator for Feminist Deliver. Uh, I started last week, which is really exciting. Okay, so, and uh, so at Feminist Deliver, we are a grassroots collaboration of BC-based, two-spirited, non-binary, indigiqueer, trans, lesbian, and cis women and girls. The organization supports that come together uh, to hold a, on account of the 2019 Women Deliver Conference that took place in Vancouver. There was a four day conference last year and which some of you have attended. And uh, we have more than 30 member organizations who make up this coalition. Our approach is intersectional, anti-oppressive and decolonial. De -colonial, sorry. Uh, we'd also like to mention that the term intersectional feminism is a term coined in the 1989 Professor Kim Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how race, class, gender, and other individual characteristics intersect with one another and overlap. Let's see here. So there is a little bit of housekeeping as well, so bear with me. Closed captioning services are available as we speak. So thanks to National Camp National uh, Captioning Canada for providing this service. You can activate it by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. We acknowledge that this event is conducted in a colonial and trade language English. We aspire to host these webinars in a variety of languages and we don't want that to be a barrier for people accessing the information. However, at this time, we're faced with the limitations as a grassroots organization to, that makes it challenging for us to provide accurate and good information in other languages. We'd also like to acknowledge that the internet and tools um, are a privilege, that we do the best that we can in situations that we're in, and that the internet should not be a utility, should be a utility and not a luxury item. So in the next two hours, we will have a discussion between panelists a conversation that will be centering around Indigenous people. We ask those who are joining us today to witness and decenter themselves and not comment or ask any questions. Um, so you can do this work outside of this panel and in your own discussions. If you are on Facebook Live, we ask you to refrain from commenting as well. We ask you to refrain from posting live during the event, such as live tweeting, and to take the time to really pay close attention and center our panelists and what they will be sharing with us. You can post your thoughts afterwards Honestly, and like share the recording with your friends and family. There will be a recording available after the event. That being said, you might notice that our panelists um, and our moderator are all wearing yellow. And uh, so that is in honor of Chantal Moore. Um, Stay golden was uh, one of her uh, quotes of, of life. And so we do recognize there is an event that's happening parallel to this event, an in-person event at legislature in Victoria. And we wanna honor and give our solidarity to the family who have organized that event and that we do stand with you even though we are here in this moment. And we would like for you to join us in uh, supporting the family in two ways. One being that you are welcome to, if you um, have the ability to donate to the family, the link for the GoFundMe is available uh, when you register and it'll be available after uh, the event closes. As well, for, uh, please join us uh, at this moment to uh, have a moment of silence. So wherever you are, please just spend one moment thinking of Chantal Moore and her family and think of those who are gathered in Victoria right now. Uh, 
Aichka, thank you very much. And uh, that being said, again, um, I just wanted to say thank you all for being here. I'm very excited to start my new role with Feminist Deliver. And I would like to hand off uh, to the moderator, Rhiannon Bennett. OCMC Ayat, Haït Nisqualo and Zikwitznala, Antha Rhiannon, Tlitsna Kumathquiam, E Feminist Deliver. So, my dear friends and relatives, it gives me good feelings to see the list of your names and phone numbers, um, since I can't see your faces today. Uh, my name is Rhiannon, and I am from the, I'm a proud member of the Musqueam Indian Band, um, and as well as I'm Feminist Delivers Decolonization and Accountability Consultant. Um, we have a really exciting um, group gathered for you here today. Um, yeah, like we a lot of work went into putting this together, and as we were trying to um, put our panel together and invite our panelists and do that work, uh, it's really apparent that there we could do one of these uh, two at least a two-hour, if not a four-hour panel every week, every day, um, maybe even a couple a day, because there is there is certainly not a shortage of powerful and needed Indigenous voices to be heard. Uh, but also the variety of topics that impact us on a daily on a daily basis. So we're going to be touching on quite a few different things today. Um, but today is I want all of um, the people here who are here to listen uh, to really come with an open heart and an open mind and be prepared to receive the messages that we're going to share today. It's important that um, that you hear what we have to say, and then you do something about it. So it's not enough to keep consuming Indigenous knowledge and keep consuming the time and labor of Indigenous folks. If it's not action, then things aren't changing. So there'll be some more calls to action as we go through and at the end, but I just wanted to put that out there right away, um, that this is um, the expectation of you coming today is that you are going to then go and do something. So it's my great honor to introduce all of our panelists today. Um, I'm, if you could just give yourselves a wave when I, when I call your name. So first I'd like to introduce Kim Haxton. Give a wave, Kim. Uh, Kim is a multi-dimensional dimensional educator rooted in knowledge and steeped in community. She is Pado Wadamai. Did I get that? Close enough. Anglicized. <laughs> From Wasa U. I'm sorry, I should have done that first. Uh, she has worked across Turtle Island um, and abroad in various capacities. She is always emphasizing local leadership development towards genuine healing. In her work with Indigenize, a creative arts-based organization she co-founded, Kim works with Indigenous communities towards decolonization and lateral liberation. Grounded in the arts and in the natural world for embodied awareness and facilitated in rites of passage, Kim develops uh, trauma recovery, diversity, and anti-oppression education, land-based education, and leadership in corporate and non-profit agencies for the past 25 years. All the things. Thank you for being here today, Kim. Okay, next we have with us Diana Day. You have a wave. Diana Day is First Nations from the Oneida Nation, a member of the Wolf Clan, and has lived in Vancouver since the early 80s. Diana is passionate about social justice issues that impact the health and welfare of the most vulnerable. Diana has an honors degree in psychology and is the lead matriarch for the Pacific Association of First Nations Women since June of 2017. Her work experience includes work at the local, regional, provincial and national level ranging from program development to management. With exceptional facilitation skills, Diana has provided personal and professional development training for Indigenous people in Canada and the United States. Diana volunteers as a board member for the Metro Vancouver Aboriginal Executive Council in Vancouver. Her most important role is mothering her two young adult children, Alexander and Angeline, both in post-secondary studies. Welcome, Diana. Next, we have Melissa Moses. Give a wave. Give a, yeah, power pump. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs representative, Melissa Moses, upholds the Missing and Murdered 
um, Women and Girls Calls for Justice. Her work empowers Indigenous women and girls and strengthens the collective safety and wellness of Indigenous communities. In addition to being UBCIC's women's representative, a role which is integral to UBC's work promoting the equality and welfare of Indigenous women and girls, Melissa Moses is an accomplished Muay Thai and self-defense instructor. I've lost my spot. Uh, to be certified by the Sport Authority of Thailand and the Nai Kahamotam Association, both in Canada and the United States. Founder and owner and chief instructor of the Nicola Valley Muay Thai Self-Defense, she has devoted and channeled her wealth of knowledge, expertise, and passion for protecting and empowering Indigenous women and girls. Melissa's goal is to conduct a series of self-defense seminars in Indigenous communities and reserves across British Columbia. These self-defense seminars will create safe and inclusive spaces to teach Indigenous women and girls how to defend themselves in common scenarios of violence and assault, and to allow them to begin healing and find um, catharsis from trauma. Melissa Moses is, I uh, did not ask you how to pronounce do you want to say? So I, I've got silk. Inclicum, silk, and satlium. No, OCM. Thank you very much. Uh, my apologies for my colonialized mouth. Uh, raised in the heart of the Nicola Valley is a proud member of the Lower Nicola Indian Band. Whew. Powerhouses. Okay. And Angela Cooper, give a wave, Angela. Angela Cooper is a multidisciplinary artist of Cree heritage and a member of the Poundmaker Nation. She was born in Edmonton, Alberta, on the unceded territory of Treaty 6, a traditional meeting ground and home of many Indigenous peoples, including Cree, um, including Cree, um, Blackfoot, Métis, and Notka Sioux, and I'm missing one. The Sioux, Sioux, what's the other one, Angela? That's okay. Um, I just, I totally neglected um, making sure I pronounced all of these before we got going. She was adopted at the age of five and grew up in a family of settler heritage. She is a recent recipient of the 60 Scoop Settlement is actively working on revitalizing her Cree heritage. She's finishing her Bachelor's of Arts in Professional Communications at Royal Roads, Royal Roads University online while she pursues a career in acting in Vancouver. Uh, she's passionate about researching trauma-informed approaches and the impact of intergenerational trauma in relation to the economic disparity of marginalized communities in Canada. Welcome, Angela. Okay, and Shanice. Shanice Angus was born and raised in East Vancouver on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. She's worked for the downtown east side for three years as a frontline worker in various shelters and SROs. She then started working as a program assistant and RISE leader at community centers with the city of Vancouver and a variety of community centers around East Van. Shanice attends Douglas College for the Aboriginal Child and Family Communication Service Program. The program gave her a greater understanding of the historic effect that colonization had on the people of Turtle Island, which also helped her understand why community centers had such diverse populations um, but lacked Indigenous pro participation in some communities. She's now working as a group facilitator to support others, not only on the fitness journey, but their emotional, mental, and spiritual journey as well. Welcome everybody. So we've got a variety of expertise on the panel with us today, and we're just gonna dive right in. So first question, this is, uh, um, to sort of just to get us going here a little bit. So feel free to answer um, if you have it in your heart. Uh, this is not directed at anyone in particular. So what is one thing you were excited about today? I'll answer that. Um, this is Melissa. 
Uh, I just want to show some recognition to uh, one of our Nicola Valley warriors. He's a 19 year old indigenous member of the Lower Nicola Indian Band. His name's Darius Sam. And about a month ago, he had decided to take an action and do his part in serving our community here in the Nicola Valley, here in Merritt, British Columbia. Uh, here he, he realized that there are many people who are struggling with the, within our community. And he had decided that he was going to run 100 miles within 24 hours to raise money for our local Nicola Valley Food Bank. His original goal was $1,000 to do this run. As of today, when I woke up this morning, his mom had posted they have raised so far $92,655.41 for our local food bank. And this was amazing to watch. And, an, and a, a young indigenous warrior who inspired a community who's, you know, we, as, as a lot of other communities, uh, you know, we're, we're known for race having being, having people that maybe be racist, discrimination, but he brought indigenous people and non-indigenous people together to support a common cause. And if that, is not decolonization in a time of reconciliation. I don't know how else to describe what he did. Uh, he was a, he's a hero in our community, a champion for our indigenous people. And this is the quote that he has that really touched me was, quote by Darius Sam, I believe we as humans are stronger together. By offering a helping hand, we will not only make a difference, we will rise together through this adversity. So knowing that, uh, he got through to the majority of his run, but at the very end, he had to stop and he had to go to the hospital. Uh, and he actually, he inspired our indigenous youth in our community to continue his run and finished his 100 miles. But Darius Sam, being the young warrior he is, he checked himself out of the hospital and he completed his run. And this has inspired a lot of our community, inspired a lot of, a lot of uh, people here in British Columbia. Um, so the now goal when I chatted with, uh, with, our, with the family this morning was that they wanna reach $100,000. So, if uh, any of our attendees would like to help out to help this young gentleman out to reach his goal, uh, you can e-transfer foodbank at telus.net or you can go to the GoFundMe, which is gonna be open until Saturday, 12th, Saturday, June 12th, 12 p.m. Uh, and just look up Nicola Valley Food Bank Fundraiser. So I just wanted to uh, just put our hands up to this, uh, to this young warrior. And yeah, that's what, uh, that's what got me excited about today, is waking up to that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That was some um, exciting work that he did. I was watching that on the news a little bit last night. Does anyone else have um, one thing that they're excited about today? I'll, I'll speak. I was excited about, um, about getting the women together, we had a bit of a time to uh, to meet and talk um, amongst ourselves about some of the issues and concerns that we had, and I was very excited about um, about sitting with uh, with Leslie Bon or Leslie Farley and uh, and going over some of the concerns that she had as well. And I'm sorry that she's not here with us today, but I but I can um, I, I know some of her concerns and, and there's some I share some of her concerns I should say, and so um, I will be voicing those today so thank you Nyama. thank you we had a couple other panelists that were had it in their heart to be here today and then for a variety of reasons they're not able um, to be with us today so our thoughts are with them so first question I'm just going to lob everybody an easy one here um, everyone talks about re what reconciliation what it is but from where you are right now what 
isn't reconciliation? And I'm going to invite Kim to answer that question first. Shoot. Um, thank you. Just one thing I was also excited about, I have tomatoes on my plant in the garden. That made me very excited, right? Grow your own food. That's what it's about. Um, what isn't reconciliation? You know, it's a lot of words that look that, you know, and, and I know people did a lot of work putting it together, but it really doesn't mean anything in regards to how we're seeing, um, like statistically, like things aren't changing in, 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 in our work. Things are being defunded, programs that are really important, right? Cultural programs, um, educational programs, you know, there's not the money for that. And, and so there is no work and, and there's still people being, as we can see this past week, um, being murdered and dying. What, how many, how many people, I think it's nine, is it this year or since April, maybe, uh, indigenous people have, have been killed. And, and so when I see that, when I see the rhetoric that I see on all the comment session sessions, um, online, whether it's a news agency or, you know, in social media, it just breaks my heart that people really haven't grasped onto it at all, the concept of what does reconciliation mean. It's almost like, oh, that's great, but people are like this, or people get defensive, you know, um, and, and I don't understand what that is. There's a place of where people aren't willing to be vulnerable to understand the history, and I think that's vital. Yeah, thanks. There's definitely a lot of um, a lot of talk about reconciliation, and there aren't always the dollars that that match. You know, it's the and it's the expectation that Indigenous folks are the ones that are doing the work, and um, the programs that get cut. You know, so often we think about and people think about the clients that aren't aren't being served anymore. But what about the Indigenous workers? So all yeah. those all those programs that are cut those are jobs that are supporting families as well right and and there's like things that i've seen i just want to give a couple more examples on this because i think it's really important is that i've seen some of the defunding and that like in the downtown east side where there's indigenous programs that have been running for let's say 20 years 21 years and you know a caucasian person uh, who's deemed you know appropriate can run the program better but i'm just like wait a second it's so this is we've just talked about reconciliation and you're taking money away from you know a program that you're already in a very patronizing way going okay if you want this money you have to do this and and it, this is ridiculous you because uh, there's a message that indigenous people that we can't take care of ourselves and we can't take care of each other you know and it and that is super um i just see it over and over and over and over again where you know the contracts go to uh, uh non-indigenous folks, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm just like, this is not, that, that's not reconciliation. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Kim. And Melissa, did you wanna add some remarks to that? Yeah, for sure. Uh, <clears throat> so everyone talks about what reconciliation is, but from where you are right now, what isn't reconciliation? Uh, reconciliation is not a trend. It's uh, not a single gesture, action, or statement. It's not a box to be ticked off. It's not about blame. It's not about guilt. And it's not about the loss of rights for non-Indigenous Canadians. And it's not someone else's responsibility. I, I always feel like we focus too much on the problem and we lose sight of the solution. And as Canadians, we should be asking how is reconciliation possible and what we can do, what can we do? And I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask probably about six questions and uh, attendees as well, just uh, answer yes or no. And uh, one, are we working towards solidarity as a society and country, yes or no? Two, recreation or uh, reconciliation is the responsibility of every Canadian, yes or no. Three, are treaties being honored, yes or no. Four, are Indigenous rights and titles being acknowledged and respected, yes or no. 
five, are negative perceptions and stereotypes of Indigenous people being let go and acknowledged? Yes or no? Six, is our past and, in, and ensuring history never repeats itself being acknowledged? Yes or no? If we answer yes to these questions, then we're well on our way for reconciliation here in, in Canada. But if we're answering no to these questions, then reconciliation is not in the process. And in order for, you know, to, in order for that to happen, there has to be awareness of the past and acknowledgement of the harm that has been inflicted, atonement for the causes and action to change behavior. Because I think when we, when we uh, kind of defined what Indigenous reconciliation is, it's about establishing and maintaining a mutual respectful relationship between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in this country. So asking our attendees, even, even our panelist speakers, like, are, are we well on our way to reconciliation in this country? Yes or no? And that's it for me. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, living, we're trying to reconcile um, with a government that won't even, that remove a leader of a party from the house for pointing out racism in response to a bill about addressing racism. So it, it, there's a, a lot of um, things that need to get uh, sorted out, which ties into our next question. When it comes to racism, what do you think issues that pertain to Indigenous people are being overlooked and how so? And I'd like to invite uh, Diana to answer this question. Yes. Um, a lot of Indigenous issues are being overlooked. Um, and it's it's really unfortunate that um, that society has placed, I guess, blame and whatever else they've placed upon us. But it's it's a it's a heavy burden that we have to carry um, as Indigenous women, especially um, because we are the the backbone of the of the family and the house post. And so it's really important that we. That we um, that we raise our children in a good way and uh, and without racism because because racists are raised those people are raised by somebody somebody raises those people they don't just they're not born like that races aren't born they're created and uh, and we have to uh, work together to make sure that we we work with our children. Our, our young ones to teach them about racism, to be able to handle it, discrimination. We know it's alive, it's well. It, it's, it's alive and well, very. And, and yesterday was a fine example of how, how racist the, the uh, Canadian government is by um, throwing out um, someone standing up for truth and keeping the racist protected. And that's what we see all too often here in Canada. It's so very, 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 very difficult. It's frustrating. It's maddening. Um, you know, we had nine recent murders, death by racism, death by racism. This is what we're seeing as Indigenous people. Um, and, and it's not nothing new, nothing new, nothing new. So in the early 60s, there was a, a call for a, an inquiry in the downtown east side. Women were getting murdered, pushed out of buildings by the dozens over 20 women a year and for multiple years. And this was in 1960. And uh, the coroner of the day asked to have uh, uh, an inquiry at that time. And we didn't have an inquiry until 60, <laughs> almost 60 years later, the Opal Inquiry. And then now we have the other, the National Inquiry. And we still have you know, the same issues that we, that we had in 1960, for heaven's sakes. Maybe the women aren't being, you know, uh, pushed as badly, but the the level of racism, the level of uh, cultural incompetency, is uh, is 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 just driving our people over the edge. And we have um, 
like I think about the, the services that are being offered in the downtown east side and the lack of cultural competency, the lack of cultural safety that our people are faced with in the downtown east side, trying to access services. We can talk, we can look at uh, a, um, a baby who was born and died at Main and Hastings in a porta potty. That shows you what kind of what kind of uh, culturally safe services we are offering our people, our people, my people. It's very frustrating. And I wanna say the racism is, 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 is so ingrained and it's so ingrained within every little thing we have. Transit, retail, finance, justice, education, and those of you who know me know that I ran for school board because I'm so passionate about anti-racism. And I know that there's racism in the school system because my children experienced it. And so I, when I spoke out about the racism in the school, it happened in the public school and it, hap I mean, it happened in elementary in grade six and it happened again in grade 10. And uh, I took them to task and I, and I met with the principal and I met with the teacher and, and said, this is wrong. You can't be making fun of our people in circle time. And, and, uh, and you know, we're not a joke. We're not there for you to laugh and joke at. Racist jokes have no place in the classroom. And for that, I was uh, labeled anti-teacher by the Vancouver District Label Council who refused to endorse me, I'm blacklisted. The first year I ran, I got 39,000 votes, over 39,000 votes. The next time I ran, I was 900 votes short of seat. And the last time I ran, I was 700 votes short of seat. I wanted to see our, our, um, our history, our education put at each level, the grade level, because it's not taught. It's not taught in schools. And, and to me, that's a shame, that's a crime that needs to happen because uh, those teachers, those janitors, those uh, administrators, secretaries, all those people around there who run that system, they can be supporting our, lifting our students up, supporting them as they should be. But unfortunately, some, not all, not all teachers are like that, but some of them are unfortunately. And we have this in every single system those people who are racist, those racist people who pass their judgments onto, onto others, who ridicule the microaggressions. Yeah. You know, so all of those things are so important. Um, uh, racism is, is prevalent in each, in each, on the bus, everywhere. So we really have to develop champions against racism. And that's something that the Pacific Association is going to do is to develop champions against racism so that we can train people how to respond. How, when you see somebody being racist to another person, what do you do? How do you respond? So we're gonna do that and I wanna create uh, champions against racism in every sector so that we can have them in justice, we can have them in education, we can have them in, in uh, retail, we can have them in finance. So yes, uh, yeah, I'm very passionate as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's that, it's just that racism is, is woven directly into the fabric of Canadian culture and Canadian identity. And the thing about culture is that culture is the things that you do think and say and feel without thought um, because they're, that's how you move and see things through the world. So, um, and then, and then, yeah, like this, this notion of like racism being black and white. And I think it ties into what's happening in, in parliament today as well is that, um, listening to some of the rhetoric come out um, about why there must be an apology for calling someone a racist for doing something racist. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and what you had said about protecting, protecting the racist, right? Is that suddenly like that's, it, it blows my mind. Like the, the worst thing you can say to, to white people is one, calling them a white person and two, saying that something they said or did was racist. So, I mean, those, those are, are important things for people listening to recognize is that um, mm -hmm. if, someone is, if someone is taking the time to show you that, that you need to, to stop and think about that. 
And I I'm, would also like to invite um, Angela um, to see what um, your reflections on uh, racism um, pertaining to Indigenous people and how, how it's overlooked, how it's, how it's normalized. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've been um, looking into this and I think um, a huge, um, a really great conversation to this is I rewatched your last video on resurgence and resistance and the anti-blackness in Canada. And um, I, it starts with the education system. It starts deeply in the roots of our history that is omitted from our curriculum that protect imperialism and the order of civilization that we call it now. Um, what we have is internal colonialism. We're continually put on the UN for uh, uh, issues of anti-blackness, the treatment of First Nations people, which are completely ignored. Uh, we have a suppression of media problem when it comes to Indigenous relations. Uh, we have police brutality. We have economic coercion in our treaties, um, part of Treaty 6. I am the fifth generation granddaughter of Chief Poundmaker that was part of Treaty 6 at the signing, uh, who was exonerated last summer by Trudeau for treason that he was wrongly accused of, for being um, cognizant of that treaties were not in the benefit to Indigenous people to start with. Um, I have a, uh, a direct quote from him. And he said, um, quote, this is our land. It isn't a piece of pemmican to be cut off and given in little pieces back to you, back to us. It is ours and we will take what we want. Uh, these treaties were completely inconsistent and they weren't on time. Uh, there's starvation on the reserve, let alone let's recognize and just sit back and take a moment to recognize the segregation of Indigenous people on reserves from colonial communities. And it's still active today. These lands weren't like resource rich or nutrient or anything that a people group can survive off of. And um, there's one book, um, I can't speak to it largely. It's in the mail, it's coming to me and it's called uh, settler colonialism in the 21st century. What we don't have is an Indian problem. We have a settler problem and cultural myths that uh, protect the, the settler um, and create the chaos of the inconvenient Indian myth. Um, and, what, um, and as I get involved in what I think are First Nations involved uh, community initiatives to help um, emerging artists or whatever is these organizations are not run by Indigenous leaders. And so the management is not Indigenous, we have no cultural competencies, and they have no uh, trauma-informed awareness, and they have no um, idea of the history, it's a job. And that's not just a job. Um, I think like why I'm excited to be here today and I didn't answer that is that we're indigenous people here taking on indigenous issues because we love our people. Because we're, we're something to be proud of. Like I'm sitting here and I'm proud of my skin, proud of my name. And I say that with an English name, Cooper. Yeah, I think it's it's a real shift, a real shift that we're having right now is that resurgence of Indigenous pride where it was so um, so shameful for so long to be Indigenous and how that's that's really shifting. Um, and just, I also want to acknowledge how colonization um, has been a direct attack on people's identity. And that's something that I don't think Canadians really understand um, and that's sort of like what gets me excited about Kim, what your, like, your lateral liberation, right? Is just that how, how colonization sort of attacked our, who we are and, and what we know about ourselves and how that um, resurgence of um, my generation and Angela's generation coming up is the no, like I am indigenous. I get to say that because that's who I am. And 
it's, you know, I didn't grow up on my reserve. Um, I grew up with a lot of my cultural teachings, but not my spiritual teachings. So it's that, that, um, that, that piece that people fail to recognize is that attack on our identity and all the work that we have to do. I don't know, Kim, this is not one of our questions, but if you wanted to speak to that. I so I'm sitting here and I'm just all like, hi, sorry, Shanice, I know you haven't spoken yet, but I just want to drop something here. So from a soci sociologist perspective, racism is a systematic exclusion of groups of people from participation within a shared system, simply, right? We can all agree on that, you know, and everything that everybody has said doesn't allow for that to happen. Okay, I want you to look at it like this on the, on the foundations that Canada has been built upon right, of colonialism. So ideas become beliefs, become truths, become policies, right? So when settlers came here, they said, nobody lived here. Actually, I think last year I was somewhere, they said, yeah, nobody was living here. And we came here and settled here. And I was like, that's like this day and age. It's all pristine. So ideas, <laughs> right, right? so ideas become beliefs. So people were like, oh, those people, remember, we we're all like, those people over there are savages, you know? And it's just like, oh, you know, ideas become beliefs. You know, those people are dirty, those people. And you can think of all the derogatory terms that people say about indigenous people. And, you know, we all know them. I don't have to name them. So people are like, well, that's the truth. I don't know how many times I've gotten in a cab or different things where people, you know, have said you can, the most ignorant things to me. And I'm just like, wow, you know, because people move here and they also hear this is the rhetoric that they're taught or that they're not taught as, as Diana talked about in schools. I just looked at some curriculum. I get young people coming to me who are young teachers who are just like that. Some of the teachers won't teach any first nations um, work like curriculum because there's no indigenous people in their classes. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. You know, and so they're getting pushback, these young kids that are, you know, champions. So ideas become truths and then eventually become policy. So it's a stairway of oppression, right? And so we see it over and over and over again, right? And and Rhiannon, you just said something too, is like we internalize it, right? We're talking about, you know, we're talking about um there's I just learned a new word this week and it's called the model minority. And I'm really excited about that one. And I just want to drop this and then I will, I will promise I'll stop because I just, you know, I can't help myself. Um, I've been gardening too much. Um, the model minority is, is when uh, somebody, and I'm not going to use, I'm going to use somebody from another culture, but there's a woman from a TV station down the States and her name is Candace Owens. And I saw some clip where she said, native indigenous people were cannibals and ate each other. And I was just like, did she just say that, you know, and, and it, the rhetoric goes on and here is a, you know, a woman of color who isn't, you know, like, is missing it. She wants to fit in, you know, and we see it happening over and over and over. And it happens within, a, even within our own communities, right? Because I've got this job and, and these positions and it's like the pushback is really challenging, right? It's been really challenging. The effects, you know, are a myriad of different intersections of the places which it's keep us keeping us separated, you know, from each other. And there's a, a very paternalistic system that is like, here's your money if you do this, because we know what's good for you. And it's just like, you know what? It's like time to back off. Okay, that's it. Sorry. I just want to add to I just want to add something. Uh you know, there's a long history of denial in Canada, and it's time to address racism in this country and stop living in the belief that it doesn't exist. And starting, like my mom always tells me, she's like, it all, she always says that we need to educate our youth and that's where change is gonna happen. I know, getting I just up. wanted to just, uh aware that Shanice has been having some technical issues and is here now and unfrozen and has you guys see me yes oh hi <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for you coming up next um is yeah that that race is about um, maybe we'll find some time to come back to that about um Oh, mom needs to tell me something. 
I think like that topic of first is not we can go on forever about it. And that's just but it's intergenerationally too. It's in within our DNA. We've been fighting this since day one, ever since the colonizers first stepped on Turtle Island. So fact that we're still living this today today shows you it's still here we go to grocery stores we're still getting followed around like we can't buy things i was at the dollar store for crying out loud and i had the security guard following me a dollar store you're you're freezing you're because freezing. of the color of my skin so I can, oh no! Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Maybe you should turn off your camera and then we can hear your voice. That might be better because you've got a slow connection or something. Hello? That's better. Clearer? Yes. Okay. So we heard you were, you were followed at the dollar store. Oh yeah, so I was followed at the dollar store, but the fact being that it was at the dollar store and because of the color of my skin, I was being followed like no, that's not okay. And I said before, we can go on and on about this, but we have a couple questions we need to answer. We do. Um, did you, Angela, did you want to add something quick to that or should we carry on with the questions? Um, I just want to like, I want to acknowledge this because I also am adopted. So I have a, um, a, a settler family and it's it's important to understand like even what that term does mean um so it just it means that you have a tie to land from your ancestors that colonized the land and you benefit from it um and it's not supposed to be it's not um a morality issue it's just a term of the facts of what is uh, so um I think it's time to change is uncomfortable and it's time to have the uncomfortable conversations. Mm -hmm. And like I'm alongside everybody in this right now. These are conversations that I'll be having in my home with my family. I think a huge helpful resource is Clearing the Plains by James Daschuk. Uh, Disease, Politics of Starvation and the Loss of Aboriginal Life, uh, starting with the fur trade. Um, it's always been about the land, it's always been about the money, and it's always about getting the First Nations off the land so that we can have the land. So it's always mm -hmm. going to be about this conversation and we get to have a seat at the economic table because our history, it's, it's always been about this. Um, I think we need to talk about de-escalation. I think um, a huge part is reading white fragility why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. And if you're having a reaction, then you know it's there. You know mm -hmm. it's there. Um, when I think about, I've been listening to a lot of uh, the Black Lives Matter um, women that are coming up and speaking on behalf of their culture. And they say, when they have to say, we're not here for revenge, we're just here for equal rights, if they have to say that, then you have to know that people know it's happening, mm -hmm. but they want to be kept sheltered from it because the system works for them. So I don't think anybody doesn't know. They just don't want to get involved because it's uncomfortable. Um, so reconciliation, it needs two mm -hmm. people for this to happen. And the settler people need to be a part of the conversation. It's not just like a simple land acknowledgement and then I can ignore this. It's, it's time for everyone to participate um, because it just doesn't happen with us doing all the emotional labor and the work and the frontline work. We need you to be involved. And so that's just one thing that I've been thinking about. And also just like um, if there's books and PhD dissertations on racism in Canada, uh, it's there. And it's not like, you know it's there. So th this isn't a conversation of, is there racism? There is, and we're, we're asking to acknowledge that. And we're here mobilizing as indigenous leaders on behalf of our people, 
because we love them and we see what's going on and we're tired of being silenced. Yeah. So sort of along that along that line, um, there's a lot of indigenizing of space spaces and creating of indigenous coordinator positions, right? Like um, I work for a nonprofit and we want to have a reconciliation plan. So we're going to hire uh, one person, one indigenous person to be the reconciliation coordinator or the indigenous coordinator for our provincial wide organization or our, our small organization. We're going to hire one, one person to do all of this. So is there, um, I mean, it, it happens all the time. There's a lot of these these positions that are being created out of there. But what are some of the concerns that we see around um, the creation of these jobs, um, sort of the hiring practice, the support for these jobs, and the expectations of these positions? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, people are, are patting themselves on the back a lot by, look, we, we've created this position. Um, and then even, or there's, or there's a funding pot to create the position. So if, if we want to maybe talk about, mm. about some of those sort of things that we see, and I'm going to pass that over to um, uh, Shanice. Hey. You want to have Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so, it's a question. Can you turn your video back off again? Though? Um, with, sorry guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry. Um, when indigenizing spaces and the creation of in indigenous jobs itself, um, one, it needs to be indigenous people. Two, there needs to be equal seats at the table. If you are going to be creating, if you want to decolonize your organization, or in or decolonized spaces, then create a safe space for our people. You need to have equal seats. You need to have the support and understand that when you do create these indigenous jobs or you do have one indigenous person to decolonize space, it is not just the physical labor of them being there, but it's emotionally, mentally, spiritually taxing. So when an individual paid $20 an hour to be doing that kind of work after day, not only up for, for who they are as an indigenous person and speaking their own truth, that one individual does not speak for every single one of us. We can only say things from our own lived experiences. And I think for us to move forward with that, we need to have the right support, the money as a whole, and have our knowledge keepers behind our youth, especially to have our elders be there to support them to ensure that they get the time needed to heal as we are on our journeys. Especially for me as an Indigenous youth working in an organization, in any organization, I get asked so many questions day after day. I get tokenized and I never than the other indigenous people and that's just one one thing or else I people say because I want I share my truth and wanting to create a safer space and to invite more indigenous peoples to the table they're like well not everything's about indigenous people excuse me you're on our you're on indigenous territories this is our safe space that you guys stole from us. If we're in an urban community, trying, wanting to heal and wanting to, and for the city to want to, or not just the city, sorry, Canada as a whole wants to, to reconcile, 
you need to do the work. You need to decolonize the policies. You need to educate yourself. You need to ensure that the employees and the employers have a trauma-informed um, training. But along with like some history themselves of what are, who our people are. If you're a community center or if you're an organization that works for indigenous people and you're not indigenous, educate yourself. Canada needs to be putting their money where their mouth is and hiring our Indigenous people to do this work. We don't need people to be talking for us or doing the work for us. There's how many of us here? Just at this panel, there's six of us Indigenous women speaking our truth. We're six individuals out of thousands and thousands of indigenous people across turtle island we're just looked over we need to stand tall and we do stand tall sorry we do there's and when you talk about reconciliation going back to that question that's just a word to me the work needs to be done to reconcile is for people of all backgrounds to come together. For us as indigenous people, we've, we've waited. We have had our arms open. We've always, when the settlers first came here, our peoples, we had our arms open to welcome them to our traditional territories. And what happened? We are put on reservations. Our kids were taken away from us. The 60s scoop. We have most kids, most of our, we have the most kids within the welfare system, which is just, it's shameful. But um, I think topic here starting to, to um, starting to break up again oh no okay well you can shift off to the next person sorry I think one of the the pieces that was in there that might have been a little bit um, garbled through the connection was just um, Shanice bringing up the point that there are more children in government care uh, now than there was at the height of the residential school system mm. um, Diana, did you have some more thoughts on that? And as well as sort yeah. of how employers yeah. sometimes might be asking like too much of indigenous indigenous workers as well. Like that over that overburden. Sure. Yes, this is very true. I just wanted to speak about that uh, the ch number of children and in, in, um, care right now because when I first moved to Vancouver in the early days, I met with um, Jean Carter at the Friendship Center who was working at the Friendship Center there and she was just appalled at the number of kids in care and, and talking about that time about how it was more than at the high residential school at that time. So it's only increased since then and so yeah we have a lot of work to do. There's a, a microscope that's put on our people um, now because of all the all the uh, inquiries and different things that have been happening. So heightened uh, police and uh, social workers are on high alert looking for looking for parents for the first thing to go do wrong so anyway just thinking about that and uh, how um, yeah, how much the, the, the system uh, spent time on the foster care but not on reuniting the family so if they spent that money to keep the family intact it would, it would work so much better you know to be able to um, spend money to bring somebody into the house to keep the family intact bring somebody into the house to to teach whatever you need to teach uh, don't take the children out rip the family apart you know and give thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to the foster care family to watch those kids anyway so <laughs> yeah I can say a lot about that too um, but yeah the other thing about uh, creating positions, Indigenous positions, we have to be um, Indigenous managed and led. Um, I'm proud to say the 
Pacific Association of First Nations Women is 100% Indigenous women managed and led. And, um, you know, it's so important that all of our organizations are Indigenous people managed and led. We have non-Indigenous people on some of our boards and we have um, non-Indigenous coordinators, non-Indigenous executive directors. I'm a member of MVAC and I can tell you that there are, you know, other executive directors who are non-Indigenous leading um, Indigenous organizations and we need to stop that. We need to mentor people. If you know, if you have someone um, uh, on, on staff and, and uh, they look like a good candidate, then let's bring someone in to, to mentor them. Let, let's not just hire, hire a non-Native person um, without lived experience, without, you know, all the knowledge that comes with being Indigenous is just uh, incredible. And you can't, and it's lived experience and you can't uh, just uh, bring someone, you know, even we have people who uh, unfortunately taken from the six and now are just coming out and, and re-identifying with, uh, with their own um, culture and their own history and all of that. And sometimes uh, some of the people, we're all at different levels of our learning and of our healing. And so sometimes people come with no knowledge and they get this job, this big job with, with, with uh, you know, all the stuff to do, but they don't have all that background. They don't have all that background and history to, to help them along on their way. And, uh, and, then, and then we have the other issue where we have non-Indigenous people in positions that were supposed to be for Indigenous people. Like I'm thinking about the school board for one. So we have Indigenous teachers there who are not Indigenous, no lived experience, no nothing. And, and some of them are very, very good. Some of them are very, very good. Liz Creek at um, Van Tech, she's not Indigenous, but she's got a heart of gold. And that's what we need. We need teachers with hearts of gold. We need teachers who can see that you know, potential in everyone and, and to lift those students up. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have that right now. Um, you know, some of our teachers are, were raised by racists and, and they're racist themselves, unfortunately. And so they bring that, that uh, burden onto them. And also the other thing too, with the police force. So we have an indigenous liaison officer for Vancouver, the Vancouver Police Department, and she's non-Indigenous, Allison Hill. She's a great woman, but she's not Indigenous. Uh, she was adopted. Uh, she's not sure. I asked her if she was Indigenous. She wasn't sure if she is or not, but uh, she doesn't look Indigenous. But, you know, those kinds of things we need. And, and, and so she's not Indigenous. I've been here for three years, and just this past, um, this past year was the first time that we met we met. So, you know, it's just like, you know, if you put an Indigenous person in an Indigenous position, that person has the knowledge to go and do the job, what needs to be done. But once you, once you start uh, putting non-Indigenous people, and, and then we have these unions and this uh, prior, uh, seniority thing, business, we, we have to, uh, that's not working for our people. That's not working for us. That works for you. That works for you. But it doesn't work for us. That yeah. does not work for us. We need Indigenous people in those Indigenous jobs. Yeah, there's definitely a gap in um, in like co in collective agreements. Don't don't so collective agreements don't support Indigenous workers. Mm -hmm. No, we need to change that. How can we yep. get that changed? So I know like a lot of um, a lot of places want Indigenous people to do and to be Indigenous, right? Like we need an Indigenous person to do this. And then they get penalized. And sometimes, sometimes they don't need a person; they need a department. Well, they need yeah. a whole indigenous yeah. department. But then they, then the indigenous workers get penalized for taking time off to go to funerals, for taking time off to access ceremony, um, and for they get penalized for being who they are. But that's what they were hired to do. So yeah. how do you hire someone to do cultural support work and then deny them access to to their culture? So then um, that's what leads to that revolving door of workers is people are coming in and out. And then we all know where the safe places to work are and where those ones aren't. So I, I know I, I tell a lot of folks yeah. all the time that, that, that come to me with, but no qualified indigenous people applied. Yeah. And I, and I call well, them that. So I, want to say I, think that I want to say that people can train people. You can, you can train people to, to do that. They don't have the qualifications. Train them. Get a, a wage subsidy, whatever, and train yeah. them up. The other thing yeah. I wanted to mention about that, um, oh, I lost it. That's okay. So, and just, and how, um, 
um, that people, people, indigenous folks aren't applying because they know it's not a safe space to work. So yes, um, and even then they think. So that I wanted to say that the can I can I finish this before before sure. I lose the thought that um, um, indigenous workers in mainstream uh, organizations are not being treated well all the time. Mm. And so we have to be really careful. Those mainstream organizations, you know, there's lots of money for Indigenous uh, uh, programming and a lot of mainstream organizations go after that money. And they don't have the, the cultural competency to do the job, to do a mm. good job. And we have uh, the downtown east side is full of those organizations. And so, um, and so WorkSafe BC, so this past week, there was an article in the paper that a woman, Indigenous First Nations woman, who was working at uh, Car uh, Oppenheimer Park, at the community center there at Oppenheimer Park, she uh, did a workplace, WorkSafe, <laughs> WorkSafe complaint about culture, the lack of cultural competency. So cultural, cultural competency, lateral violence, those things are things that we face in the workplace. And I'm so happy to see that now WorkSafe BC, we can address those things through WorkSafe work BC. So cultural competency is really important. You guys gotta, you guys gotta get on the ball. You gotta, are you gonna be faced with some WorkSafe BC thing? So yeah. Thanks. So That's good to know. Yes. Very good to know. So happy. Is this connection better? Can you guys see and hear me? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm just going to go on my phone then. We're good. Okay. Uh, so shifting gears a little bit. Um, so when you, so I'm going to pose this question to Melissa. When you think about the, the connection, what do you think the connection is when you hear the phrase harm to land is harm to Indigenous women? You're still muted. You're still muted, Melissa. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, when I hear the term uh, harm to land is harm to indigenous women, I've also heard uh, uh, land justice is gender justice, violence on the land, it's violence on our bodies. I've heard indigenous women in environmental violence, violence against the earth is violence against our women. But I believe like to better understand that connection is that for indigenous communities in, in North America, not just, not just Canada, but here in North America, the links between land and women create a, a powerful inner intersection. One that when one is overlooked or, or discounted can threaten their very existence. And I'll say that one again. When one is overlooked or discounted can threaten our very existence. And when I, so like violence against the, the earth is violence against our women. In each indigenous community, women hold a unique, unique relationships with the land that are, that are uh, nation, traditional, territory specific and colonialism has uh, tried to destroy this relationship uh, forcibly by displacing indigenous communities and removing women from their traditional roles. And this was done, you know, as, as it was done with the residential schools, as my mom was a residential school survivor as well and day school survivor. So I've, I've, I've got to see this and experience this as well growing up. Uh, violence like this was committed against Indigenous women and their communities to, to prevent the traditional ways of knowing and being from being passed on to us children. And this process of colonization has made it easier for settlement on traditional lands and extraction of natural resources. And uh, yeah, like extractive industries have drilled, mined, fracked on on lands near resources rich in rich in you know indigenous territories for decades and although the economic gain um, has been a beneficial to transnational corporations and the economies of you know both Canada and the US today 
this has come to a, a significant cost to our Indigenous communities, uh, particular women and young people. And many of these communities are, are sites, sites of chemical uh, manufacturing and, and usage of uh, and, and waste dumping, while Others see uh, an intro, uh, introduction of large encampments of men, uh, like man camps, uh, which is the devastation. Well, I guess it's uh, it impacts us on a, on our environmental violence, and this causes uh, ranges from from uh, sexual and domestic violence, drugs and alcohol. Uh, murders and disappearances, uh, reproduction of illness and toxic exposure, threats to our culture and our indigenous life, life ways, crime and other social stressors. I mean, I think the, the very health of our indigenous nations is, is threatened, but there has been little action by policymakers and international bodies because of a lack of formal documentation of, of the damages on our land. So again, I think uh, uh, to, to better answer that question, uh, the, the links between land and women is, uh, you know, when you overlook, when one is overlooked or discounted, uh, that, could, that could threaten our very existence as, as Indigenous communities, indige Indigenous people. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it, there's a lot, um, lot to be said for the connection between uh, women and the land. And um, Diana, did you want to contribute some thoughts oh, on that? Yeah, I would just, I would just, um, it made me think about um, JB, the first lady and her song, the most unprotected woman um, in the world is, uh, is actually is Mother Earth. So yeah, and just how unprotected um, she is how yeah so much damage and uh so many of the mining um companies are in in canada their, their headquarters which is quite shocking um to me and uh just to see the devastation worldwide of indigenous peoples uh resources and land is uh is heartbreaking and to know what's happening now with um with the Wet'suwet'en people and, and uh, the RCMP abusement, abusing them um, and other people as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's terrible what's happening. And, and yeah, and we are really talking about normalizing a lot of the, a lot of the uh, use that our women are, are subjected to. And, uh, and so that, that, has to, that has to stop. Um, as well too so you know just thinking about the all the views that are that are mother earth uh, is against is uh facing and, and it's the same with our women um indigenous women are are uh facing a lot of abuse um emotionally physically mentally and spiritually so all forms so just uh remembering all our women in our prayers is really important uh, for us to do on a daily basis um, and to lift each other up whenever, whenever and wherever we can. So that's something that the Pacific Association is really working hard at doing. Yeah, it's really, it's really hard to separate uh, like racism towards Indigenous people or anti-Indigenous from the land. And I think that's what, what Canadians really want to see. The, and that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I recognize that reconciliation is dead is because we can if we are only trying to repair a social relationship without addressing the land issue um there's always going to be that disc that disconnect so it's yeah kim did you want to add on that i do thank you um thank you everybody um there's a couple things that you know my brain is going a thousand miles an hour on this conversation i'm like yes yes and and um is, is that there's like, we're looking at two different worldviews, period. We're looking at a dominant culture that doesn't have to look at what's happening. There's a bypass and bypass, when I say that, I mean the hierarchical structure 
that has existed in the dominant culture. Um, Thompson Highway a long time ago said, uh, in one worldview, there's a story about a man and a woman named Adam and Eve, and they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And in another worldview, we didn't get kicked out of the Garden of Eden. So in the other one, which became obey, guilt, shame, blame, guilt, sort of teachings that kind of predominated of creating imperialism, colonialism, and all of the different isms that created was this real place of separation, right? This real place of in, a, in, the, ed, in the dominant education system, you know, how worthy are you? Um, so back to this piece that's really important is that when people live on the land, if anybody has a garden, I mean, most people, we're so removed from it because we've been indoctrinated to be dependent upon a system, right? And, and that's a real um, big one to hold. I think, Angela, you were talking about it a little bit. You kind of alluded to it. But I think it's a really important one to, to think, to look at. You know, the earth is like a mama simple the earth gives us food and water like the mama gives you milk from her breast right simple you know uh women in our culture have a different role most indigenous cultures this is a i'm doing a pan indian thing right now which is not okay but i'm gonna say it right now before colonization women held the economic power women held the baskets and knew wh which families alan lindley auntie alan i'm talking to you right now you know, women knew where the food needed to go to nourish and uplift people. We didn't have police, we didn't have taxes, we didn't have these things, you know, because there was a place of reciprocity and respect and responsibility. As a mm. mother, you have those that are innate. So we can talk about it as a metaphor, or we can talk about it literally as the earth is poisoned. She's sick right now. She's hitting up. She's heating up. She's like, get rid of this pestilence. You know, it's not okay. And and so there's a real disrespect, or, um, disregard. And I think this is a really important in the mainstream narrative that I think is really important for people to do their work upon, is that it's really easy. And because we work and and Diana, I know that I do, I apologize right now before I say anything that I offend anybody and everybody. But you know, and now I can say it, um, it, it is that there's a place around how we serve politics, right? That we're seeing when we're talking about reconciliation, when we're talking about relationship to land, you know, politics. What we saw yesterday uh, in the House of Commons, you know, and and is that politics comes from here? It doesn't embody all of this. So when we talk about decolonization, and I just want to drop this one quick story, just, just as a, as an opening, like the, the, just to what, so you can get a glimpse of what I'm talking about as Indigenous people. Um, uh, there's a, there's a language that is older and the way that we communicate or can communicate that exempts all of this educational and way that we've been indoctrinated into being. Um, Many, many years ago, it was in uh, Borneo with the Penan, I believe, where the scientists were asking uh, the old men, you know, how do you know which plants go together? You're going to make it, you know, how do you know you're going to uh, make a poison? There's 30,000 green plants here. And the old man said, because you can hear the, you can hear the plants sing. If the notes harmonize, you're going to make, you know, a medicine. If they don't harmonize, you're going to make a poison. Okay, so think about that. Fast forward to uh, Ornacon and Basin, Venezuela. I'm working with this um, with this gentleman named Jose Luis, and he's making these medicines in this pot. We're looking at it, and I said, "How, Jose? Like, how do you know how these plants go together?" And he looked at me just straight as this, and went, "Because can't you hear the music?" And it really dawned on me that like I can't hear that even though we have this ability to feel. And this is my question, and this is for the place of the inaction. We are not in action. I'm not giving anybody any props to like not, but empathy and compassion are part of this thing that we need to be doing, right? Because like, why is it that the dominant society doesn't care? I just about swore, but I, I didn't. Um, you know, why they don't care, why they don't do it. It's like, oh yeah, you know, people have become so desensitized because of how we've been indoctrinated instead of like here, as a mother, you know, when your kid is sick, you can feel it or you've got the soul phone. You're like thinking about somebody you haven't seen in a long time. And we've been indoctrinated not to trust that. So politics is based on the strategic, it's kind of like right, right brain or left brain. I don't know which one is the thinking one, you know? Um, and, and that constructs this destructive pathway. And we are so attached 
to destruction and and those stories that we hang on to i'm not a racist or maybe you're not however this is not about morality you know the structure is set up of not an equal system okay so when we look at the land when we look at indigenous people that are that are framed on the media as pro protesters instead of protectors you know we become indoctrinated ideas become beliefs become truths right so we live in a society and a system that is uh set up in this hierarchy instead of together we are here together you know you talked about the jobs and and that those places in which you know we're again we're having people come into jobs in this big system. Okay, we've got our checklist because we've got one, you know, indigenous person or we've got one black person or we've got, you know, on and on and on. But the problem is, is that it is a certain culture that negates anything else. Why would anything else exist, you know? And it doesn't, you know, we can't help it. This is in our bloodlines, you know, on how we, how we are together. And I mean that in a together place, you know, one more, one last drop on this one. And then I, I will stop because, you know, I'm one of those, I'm one of those aunties that just likes to rant, you know, there's a fourth century and I'm saying this for um, our non-Indigenous friends. Uh, there's a fourth century Jewish scholar named Mamamides who talks about the eight levels of charity or giving or generosity, you know, uh, the worst one being, oh, I have this, but you can have this, but you have to do it like this. So the receiver gives belligerently, or the, the, the giver gives belligerently, the receiver receives being like, okay, please give me this. Does that sound familiar? Our universities, our things, our, our education system is on that kind of level, all the way down this gradient goes to where the receiver receives and the giver gives without, and the receiver receives a berry plant. Anybody ever picked a raspberry? That's, you know, that's just a gift that you're like, you don't think about that, but there's just a gift. Okay. And then indigenous cultures like the potlatch system on the West coast, right? Your, your status isn't held by how much you have. It's about how you take care of your communities. Right. And we don't live in a society that is structured that way. We live in a hoarding society where some people have so much and some people it's like, Oh, can I please, please, you know, and when we look at the, the effects of intergenerational trauma, and I'm talking about for indigenous people, as we start unpacking those, whether, whether it's um, self oppression or internalized pro um, oppression from trauma that we carry that we carries out in lateral violence in our communities, you know, is that we're doing our work. We don't, we're doing our work and we know what to do. You know, in white culture, I'm asking you to, uh, we are asking you to like do your, stay in your lane, right? Stay in your lane and do your work because you came here carrying that. And white culture, like I said, is the dominant thing that doesn't have to look at it because it's bypassed. That's it. Thank you. Hmm. And I just have to say, I have to say, um, being a Haudenosaunee woman, uh, Oneida, that uh, we are a matriarchal community and that the, the clan mothers actually choose the chiefs um, in, the, in the community, so for the clan, so because it's the clan mothers who, who see which, which men are, are worthy of chieftainship, which who's the good protector, the qualities, the, the skills, the things that we need to, to be a leader. So that's how things were done. And then with the, the colonization and the, the systems that were put in place, the Indian Act and all those things, and, um, yeah, the woman's role was not only the woman's role, but also the men's role as well. So the woman's role was taken and also the men's role was taken because the men's role were to protect and to provide for, for all the community. So, you know, so it's so unfortunate that we had this colonization put upon us and, and uh, oppressing us. And so um, what's happened is people are lashing out because of that oppression and lashing out at each other. So a lot of misdirected anger, a lot of misdirected uh, hurt. And uh, yeah, so we have to look at, at those issues and, and work with our people. Um, yeah, to, to work. That, that's that's our that's our work that we need to do. That's not the work that we need uh, Canadians to come and help us with. As like what Kim said, no. white white folks and yeah. white culture needs to stay in their lane. Yes. Um, so but we just, need we need we need the funding in order to do yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, we need the funding in order to do that uh, and not to be culturally appropriating our, our things. Yes. So on funding related. Um, I'm going to pose this question to Melissa. So 
we've seen the, the funding pouring out in response to, to COVID-19 and the support programs and the, the different um, uh, support programs that have been created so that people are, are not going without. Um, there's been a lot of um, funds and services that have been created and created very quickly. So we, we watch the news and we've watched these billions of dollars pouring out like that and how quickly the government shifted like that. And it wasn't that long ago, we're talking like weeks, months, um, that Indigenous people stood up and shut down Canada and the outrage and the, the rule of law and the economy can't do this and you can't do that. Um, and then how quickly the government was able to, to shift to support people to, through COVID. So with that in mind, um, why is it that you think that um, the calls to act, the calls to justice are now on the back burner. So there's, we we're told time and time again that the government doesn't have funding. It's not a priority. Um, there's such, there's been report after report after report. So what, what makes you think about why um, the government has been so quick to react and to fund and to move for COVID um, yet action moving forward on calls to action, calls to justice have are growing uh, dust bunnies. Because uh, we're not a priority. We've never been a priority. Uh, we've we've uh, been put on the back burner and we've time and time again, we've, we've heard broken promises and uh, the National Inquiry into Missing Murdered Indigenous Women. They, they, uh, it was a 1,200 page report that listed 231 calls for justice. And you've had families of missing and murdered come forward and share their stories and relive the trauma. And they, this report laid out the roadmap. For, for the National Action Plan that was supposed to be released on the one year anniversary, which was June, June 3rd uh, of this month. And, uh, and the federal government had used the, the pandemic as an excuse, which is really hard to believe that, you know, within 12 months, 10 months, they had, they had time to draft up this National Action Plan or even come close of getting it done. And then the last two months was when the pandemic hit. So they could have released something. You know, a, a lot of those 231 calls for action were, were simple solutions, you know, which, which, which was really easy for them to come up, even with a partial action plan. But instead, they, they decided that uh, we're not a priority. And even though the National Women's Association of Canada, they did a survey of what, like 250 uh, women. And, uh, and the women basically were saying that they were more afraid of the, the violence and domestic abuse. And they're more afraid of that than they were of COVID. And, and, and I mean, that says, that says a lot and, and to, to, to hear this, because that was the National Enquirer is the reason why I moved back home to Canada um, to start teaching self-defense. And, uh, and I, Gladys Raddick, uh, she came and she spent the day with me uh, not long after the, we heard about the delay in the National Action Plan. And she, I can just, I can feel it because this, her and Bernice Williams, they, for the past, what, like eight years, they were doing this justice for, uh, tears for justice or walks for justice. Uh, and, you know, they've, they fought for this, in, this national inquiry. And I know Bernice has been doing it probably uh, for like the last 50 years or so. And, uh, and you can just hear the anger. It was like, they, 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 put all this energy into it and bringing all the families together. And now they have, have the proof, they have the roadmap, they have now, now this is when the government was supposed to come up with this action plan. And then all of a sudden a year later, they just wash that. And now the families are wondering, 
uh, you know, like now what's going to happen? I'm like, are they like, what is the timeline? Like they can't even tell us when the timeline of when this national action plan is supposed to be released. And, and the families are asking me, who are they consulting? Who are they consulting? And to be honest, I, I don't think they really need to be consulting anybody if they have a 1200 page report that's going to lay out what they should do for the national action plan. And I mean, if they can't write it out, then may as well give us ladies a pen and paper and we'll write it out for them and have them sign off on it so we can, you know, so we can get started. But yeah, if uh, I know, I know like Diana, Kim, uh, you know, I know you ladies have been in this for a really long time because I've heard your names out there. Um, if you want to chime in on this, I would, I definitely would love to hear what you ladies have to say. Yeah, I, was I, was just, I was just on a call this afternoon with um, uh, Minister Bennett and a few other ministers and a bunch of people from around the country. Um, and it was with the, um, the Manitoba um, MMIW coalition and what they're doing over there um, are some great and wonderful things. And, and I was so excited they have an indigenous women's healing center in Winnipeg. And I just thought, how awesome, wouldn't that be just wonderful if we had something like that here for indigenous women um, with housing attached to it. So, and, and education, but anyway. <laughs> that's a, a dream um yeah so yeah just thinking about how it, it is a long way and so one of the things that the pacific association is doing with our funding we've got three years funding so we're going to be uh, looking at a, a local action plan developing a local action plan we're developing an indigenous women's council with the, the host nations and with some of the organizations here and um and the ally organizations doing some work so um, yeah, so those are some of the things that we're doing to, to ensure that the, the, um, the calls for justice are implemented here in Vancouver. And one of the other things that we're doing, we're working with the, the Vancouver Police Department, I mentioned before, um, um, and um, in the city of Vancouver, and we're going to be developing a toolkit um, for women to make a complaint um, about the police, if they have to complain about police conduct or, or lack of investigation because that's the other complaint that our people have is that they don't investigate our stuff. <laughs> you know, when we, when we have people going missing and uh, other stuff happening there, they're, they're not investigating. So we're developing a toolkit and part of that is to have a focus group. So our, I put a call out for women who have already made a complaint to the police, if you can contact us and, and, and join our focus group to find out uh, what that process was like. There is, we do have a good ally in the Vancouver Police Department, I will say her name is Val Spicer, and she's the, the person who's in charge of diversity and a whole bunch of other things. Um, and so I've been talking to her, meeting with her um, um, quite regularly and uh, developing this toolkit. Um, so just thinking about how we need to, uh, to find those individuals in those organizations who can be allies uh, for us and to help us uh, get the work done that needs to be done. And I want to also say that too, so I'm also on the Sister Watch Committee and, and the, van the mayor, the mayor, the um, police chief, Adam Palmer, he uh, is the chief of police for Vancouver Police Department. And he's also the chief, uh, he's the president of the Canadian national organization that's the chiefs, the police chiefs. So that was very exciting to learn. We just learned that at the last Sister Watch meeting. And then after the meeting, it was quite, it was interesting because after the meeting, um, one of the, his staff sent out to the Sister Watch committee uh, a statement that he had made about George Floyd. And I was quite, um, I thought, well, that's nice, but I thought it would have been so much more relevant if he had made a statement about Chantal Moore and, and her death coming from the chiefs of police for all of the police in, in uh, in Canada. So that's something that I'm still going to approach him and uh, and ask him if he can make a statement, a public statement about the about what happened to Chantal Moore and and all the other the nine other people who were murdered um, by the police in, in this last little while. Uh, Rihanna, just a, just a quick one is that um, what Melissa had said, you know, why isn't it? Why are we still waiting? Uh, there's a $35 billion trust fund for Indigenous people in Canada, okay? 
So we don't take your taxpayers money just so you know. Okay, look that up. It's really important that you understand that. The problem is, is that why can't we be the proprietors of our own money? We're adults, you know, we can do this. We know what needs, we need women's, we need programs to change those statistics. And another reason why I believe we're talking about racism, we're talking about systematic exclusion, right? Like I said at the beginning, and what this what this then entails is that uh, the, a lot of the land, like you know, land. We talk about land, money. That means money, resources, extraction. You know, if they actually looked at the the land, whatever the legal. Um, this whole system is based on illegal land ties, whether you're in a treaty area for the treaties that haven't been honored or held, or whether you're out here on unceded territories. Like if you own a house, you probably might want to sell it because it is on an illegal land. It is true, right? But but we have this thing where it's like, oh no, we can't look at that, right? We're talking about shifting a huge system, you know, and concept, but really when we start breaking it down and looking at the cracks in the foundation, because there are lots of cracks in this foundation called Canada, you know, uh, and, and it, it, just even in the economics, whether it's the oil and gas industry that we're looking at and we're seeing it quite clear, you know, uh, but unfortunately it's been on the backs of indigenous people. But the, I think, I don't know if there's an answer, but Melissa, like, I mean, I think the answer is quite clear on that one, that uh, if for the government to have to look you know, really at what's going on to take care of Indigenous people. We don't want, it, you know, there's a thing that it might me think, makes me think that they don't want Indigenous people to be in their power because if they do, everything would fall apart, mm -hmm. you know? You know, the other thing that I just remembered too, I'm from New York, well, our people are from, originate from New York State area and we were relocated, as many of our people were relocated all over this country. Uh, so our traditional lands are in New York State and some of our people were relocated in 1840 to Oneida, Ontario by boat and then the rest of the people went around to Wisconsin by boat. Um, so I just wanted to say that what happened um, last summer was so nice. So the Oneida women from the different communities, the three different communities, they all meet um, uh, in the summer in uh, the traditional homelands. And last summer, a settler woman gifted 30 acres of her land back to the Oneida women. So that is reconciliation. Yeah. Land back is reconciliation. Land back. If you really want to be uh, reconciling, do that. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'm just being mindful of time. We've got about 18 minutes left. Um, there's a uh, closing question, but I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, wondering what we're going to do for maybe we can squeeze in why don't we just do a closing some closing questions then and then people don't won't feel so rushed as we're going as we're going through them so i'll just so our, our last question was um what organizations or movement do you think our attendees need to look out for right now um and i'll invite um angela to to speak first on that one Uh, honestly, I think Melissa and Kim and Diana would be the best to start with if I may pass mic. I, I, would, uh, I would say the National Women's Association of Canada since their, uh, for, for their advocacy and direct engagement with Canada on the National Inquiry Calls for Justice. Um, I say that because, uh, you know, this, this is this is really close and this is the reason why I'm back home in Canada. So they would be my organization that I would be keeping an eye, an eye out for and seeing what they were do to make a difference. So yeah, I'll pass it on. So send them some money. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Shanice, Shanice, did you, I invite you to, to share um, who you brought in your heart today, which organization or movement um, do our attendees need to look out for right now? Um, I want to hold the city of Vancouver accountable for that. Um, we are so called the city of reconciliation, but there's still more actions um, to happen. Um, we need more support for our indigenous peoples. And like what um, some, I don't know why, sorry. 
like what Diana was saying um, earlier, to have a healing center. I don't think it needs to be just for our women. It needs to be for our peoples. I think our people within a collective, Vancouver has the most, in, one of the most indigenous uh, locations within BC. Think about that. Why don't we have space for our peoples to heal, to work out together, to be a community? Yes, there's a Vancouver Aboriginal Friendship Center, but why can't we have more spaces for that? We have about 10 dance groups within the Lower Mainland itself that practice within their own housing lobbies. Why can't we have a warm gym to practice in? Why can't we have a space within our community center or a ceremony lodge or something for us to go to? Why do we need to go to all these different indigenous organizations all across, all across Vancouver? That's really hard, especially if you're on such a tight schedule, w working in a busy city like this. That's too hard. Why can't we have one center where, say, we see our counselor and then there's a gym, or else we see our, we go to the gym and something is, something inside you, some trauma is coming up and you can go see an elder, or you can bring back the moon ceremony, or there's so much other things. Why can't we have that? Why can't we have our women to have a safe space? Why can't, there's just so much more, sorry. Um, anyways, I think the city of Vancouver should um, really put their money where their mouth is and um, along with Canada too. It's time we give money to our indigenous peoples to do that healing that colonization has done to our peoples. The fact that we can come here today and speak our truth is something that's powerful. Hearing every single one of these speakers share their word and with how many viewers we have, these are just these individuals. The fact that we can dance and sing in a public space is powerful. But because our voices aren't heard, we are still standing here and being resilient. Because our people are still being killed, being discriminated, we're still here. We're still here standing strong and wanting to fight, not even just for Indigenous people, for all of our peoples for equality, to practice our own culture and to be, to be proud of it. We are so proud of it and we do anything to have our culture within an urban, set, urban setting like this. But as soon as we don't have a regalia on or we're not being tokenized, we're, looking, we're looked down upon. If we're not acting a certain way, if we're not dressed a certain way, it's time to create a safe space for us. It's time to put an equal amount of seats at the table. There's only so much that us as indigenous people can do, but when there's only one of us within an organization or, you know, you just, have that one like reconciliation worker or one person within the federal municipal provincial government that's not enough we have so many strong indigenous peoples within canada itself it's time to create equal seats you're on our territories the turtle island is indigenous territories now look at it. Now look at Mother, Mother Nature's doing. Thank you. Thanks. Angela? 
Yes, sorry, I just need a minute to collect my thoughts. Um, there's two organizations that um, have helped me in moving to Vancouver and revitalizing my culture is uh, PAFNW and your language program. Um, also, what is involved in that is the urban butterflies. So mm -hmm. um, supporting our little sisters and raising them up to see the leaders and the indigenous women that are healing, that are leading and that are portraying our culture in a light that is to be something to be proud of. Um, mm -hmm. A huge um, industry is support local indigenous businesses. And I, one really easy way to do that is I have a friend who founded Indigenous Fashion Week. You can go on the Instagram. Jolene. Have all, <laughs> Jolene Minton. Uh, she has all these Indigenous designers. And when you support an Indigenous designer, the funds go back to the community. That's, that's Indigenous. Um, that's a powerful thing. It's something to learn from. It's about erasing corporate greed and taking care of our community. Um, so um, having modeled in that for the first time, and, and the privilege it was to be a part of this second annual Vancouver Indigenous Fashion Week. I just wanted to bring that to myself, a little girl who grew up in like rural Alberta, who was ashamed to be First Nations in a white community. And I'm, so I just want to dismantle that in our little sisters as they grow up. There's nothing to be ashamed of. There's just only a rich culture, a rich spirituality, a rich um, economic practice, something that's really been muted, but is really beautiful. I mean, we have our artworks in museums in Europe, and they're, they're works of art, and we need Canada to recognize that. We need that to be part of our narrative. Um, like, um, I'm working on seeing if I can, as a dancer, I want to dance in my wow. Oh, I want to like dance in my power, and I want to bring that back to me. I want to feel that in my body. And, and so, yeah, it's a portable Indigenous business. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Okay. Um, I kind of want to reverse it because everybody's talking about Indigenous organizations and there's tons of them, just look out. They need your help. Um, but I want you to help yourselves, right? I want people to actually be curious from this conversation on little drops that were put out for you to do your own work, do the work around um, racism. There's lots of really cool organizations like Elevate, just self pitch there. One of the organizations I work for that does you know, racial justice work. Um, there's so many programs out there. And uh, I say get a co cohort of like white folks together. Am I allowed to say that? Uh, people of pallor. Uh, get together and uh and and do your work and focus on that and then show up because that's really what's important we're talking about lateral liberation learning to be with ourselves letting other people be with themselves letting go of the issues that bind us thank you and i i'm becoming a fond of the phrase uh people of colonial complexion <laughs> and diana um yeah, so the so the Pacific Association of First Nations Women, PAFNW, we changed our name the time the AFN changed their name. So we wanted to have AFN in our name. So we put AFNW and then we put a P in front. So that's how you can remember PAFNW. And we're on Facebook. We're doing, we have Cree and Ojibwe language uh, program. We want to lift up the community. It's huge. And so Cree is the number one language spoken in this in this territory. Um, yes, interesting. Um, so yeah, so we also have the urban butterflies. So we're doing work with the young ones. So we have uh, uh, we have some uh, we have a social enterprise that does work with uh, VACFAS and with kids in care. So we develop a relationship with kids in care from when they were young, and also um, they they've now aged out of care. So some of the some of the the women we have. Um, uh, a woman here who's, who's one of those. So just thinking about um, some of the things that we want to do, we want to have the uh, champions against racism um, is really important. So we're, you know, please uh, follow uh, PASNW on uh, Twitter and Facebook. Um, myself as well, I'm at Diana Daydream. Um, that would be good too. And, uh, and Idle No More. And uh, it's still is still around resistance. Dakota Bear is doing a lot of great work on uh, getting the word out there. 
Um, and uh, so follow Dakota Bear, follow, um, and also let's make Indigenous Lives Matter uh, an issue, a thing, and let's uh, make it, build momentum around that and, uh, and, and get our cause out there um, first and foremost. So just thinking about how, um, how a lot of organizations are doing good work on a shoestring budget, the Aboriginal front door at Maine and, at Maine and Hastings. So just thinking about those and uh, um, yeah, oh, Warriors Against Violence. Warriors Against Violence, they're, they're an organization that does some phenomenal work with our people um, who are, are struggling with, with violence and family, family violence issues. So just thinking about the, all the good work that's going on. There's so much good work going on and there's so much work to do. So thank you for listening, Nyawa. Thank you. And we've also shared the, the GoFundMe page for Chantel as well, for her family. Uh, yes, Shanice. I just wanna, um, I guess, rephrase not rephrase but um following up with diana there i do like i there's such powerful indigenous people within vancouver that are making change there's so much shape shakers here we're we're healing we have these organizations let's support them they need more funding they need to hire more indigenous peoples they need they need more support Yes, I think it's, it's yeah. Thank you, though. Thank you, Diana, for sharing that. There's um, no shortages of, of um, good organizations doing good work. Mm -hmm. So you need to yeah. open, open up, open up those wallets and spread that money out. <laughs> um, I know we've all there will be some links shared of places that you can make contributions. Um, you've all attended a two hour free uh, <laughs> seminar. Uh, which is a real gift. So if you valued your time here with us, if you've learned a few things, find somewhere to pay that forward. Um, we didn't charge. We have a scholarship. Today. I was going to say we have a scholarship fund as well. And there's a link on our, on our website for that. Great. So lots of places Donate. to spread your money. Uh, and please, um, we really do strongly encourage everybody that was here today to make a contribution to Chantel's family. Um, you shouldn't wind up dead for asking for help. Um, it's just truly, it's truly appalling um, what has happened um, and the amount of emotional labor that her family is, is um, doing right now um, is really quite, um, is really quite astonishing what, what they are doing to sort of uh, move, move the, the bigger cause forward. Uh, Justice from Chantel um, everybody needs to stay golden um, and just really uh, keeping her family in our hearts and our prayers tonight. Um, it's an incredible, um, awful situation for them to be in and um, how I'm sure that there must be some underlining twin, twinge of hurt as well at how uh, Canadians haven't shown up for her the way they showed up for George um who died in a completely different country although one could argue about that imaginary line and is canada even a country but um you know there's uh, even today like the the difference in the um attendance of um our event here today uh, compared to the panel of um of black voices uh, there's a real uh, disparity between what people will show up for and support um, and we need to we need to address that. And Canadians need to stop pitting um, black um, movements and communities against indigenous movements and communities, um, because it's you can't justify one genocide with another. You don't have it as bad as these folks do, so you should be grateful. Um, I said fairly recently to someone, please don't dress up genocide with universal health care. Um, an, an illegal occupation of stolen lands. It doesn't matter what kind of socialized program we have. Um, you're, you, you're occupying stolen lands. So we need to be mindful of that. And people need to be prepared that black and indigenous communities, we are coming together. Uh, and when those relations are, at, yeah, <laughs> we're coming together. So um, our communities are talking and supporting each other. Um, and just imagine if all those folks that came out to all those rallies to support Black Lives Matter showed up to shut down Canada. Um, so my call for all of you is when those calls from Indigenous movements come, you need to answer them. You need to stop with the uh, rule of law because whose rule of law are we following and whose rule of law is, is, um, 
is the most important one. So I see Priscilla is back with us. We're ending on a all fired up now. So <laughs> just good. I hope I'm, I'm here and just saying yes, you know, can't mention, you know, do the work. So, and this is us trying to get people motivated, energized, and feeling prepared to do that work, right? Uh, supporting each other in what we do. Uh, so thank you, Rhiannon, for moderating, and thank you to all of the panelists for being here and sharing your knowledge and your time with us, Taichka CM. And so to the attendees as well, thank you for sharing your time with us and being here. And uh, as you exit, you will be directed to a page where there are the questions for reflection. So self-reflection, a part of you doing the work, you know, like Kim said, like Rhiannon said, is uh, taking that internal assessment and seeing where are you at? What are your goals? How are you going to support indigenous rights? You know, and there is the link to the fundraiser for Chantal Moore's family and as well as the other organizations that you can support. Uh, please do uh, follow us on social media. You know, spreading the word is just as important. So subscribe to Feminist Deliver's email updates at feministdeliver.com. You can scroll down to the bottom of the page, you'll see it there. And go to Twitter at FEMDeliver, Instagram, Feminists Deliver, and Facebook, find us, Feminists Deliver. And uh, also, like we said, this is recorded. So share it with your friends, share it with your family, watch it over again. And uh, let's just keep this momentum and keep the movement happening. So yes, again, thank you, everyone. Bye. <laughs>